This program is sponsored in part by the Center for Freedom and Prosperity and the Vernon K. Kriebel Foundation. I'm from Appalachia, a coal miner's daughter. For hundreds of years, people settled here to find freedom. They persevered by relying on themselves and their family to survive. Nice. Very nice. But my home has changed. We've lost our self-reliance. Appalachia has been left to fail. I'm Emerald, a proud Appalachian, and I want to thrive, not just survive. So I'm going to Washington, D.C. and team up with famed economist Dr. Richard Ron, and together we will find those people around the globe who are thriving against all odds. Having visited countries able to emerge from poverty, I wanted to explore a country that has sustained prosperity against all the odds. According to a United Nations report, Switzerland is the happiest place on earth. The country receives top marks across the board, ranking high on many metrics of national performance, including government transparency, civil liberties, qualities of life, economic competitiveness, and human development. How has a small, landlocked country with a diversity of language, religions, and no notable natural resources achieved so much success? Well, that's what I wanted to find out. First stop, Zurich. Located in the north central part of the country, it's the largest city in Switzerland. The first obvious challenge the Swiss have overcome is the lack of a unifying language. Here they speak Swiss German, but during my visit, I'd hear three other official languages, French, Romance, and Italian. Confusing, but apparently the Swiss take it in their stride. Dr. Ron had arranged for us to sit down with Dr. Lino Gazella, president of one of the best scientific universities in the world, ETH, or ETA as the Swiss say it, the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. 19 Nobel laureates, including Albert Einstein, have roamed these halls. President Gazella greeted us in his office, which seemed befitting of the president of one of the greatest universities in the world. So good to meet you again. So nice How are you? To see you. He summed okay? up what makes Switzerland so successful. The most important cultural aspect of Switzerland is innovation. We cannot survive without innovation. If you stop to innovate, we will immediately become a very poor country. But I learned Swiss success was also built on egalitarian principles. It has always been a very democratic system. And this bottom-up giving power to the people has been always one of the leading mot motives of our existence. But how does innovation and equality produce prosperity? I asked a leading Swiss diplomat what made Switzerland become successful, even though it was improbable. I want to answer your question with an anecdote. Okay. Have you ever thought why uh, Switzerland has a watch industry? What is typical for a watch or what was typical uh, for a watch when the first watches were made in the 16th, 17th century? It's something for which you don't need a lot of material, raw material, not a lot of iron, but a lot of skilled labor. And in a country where you have no uh, commodity except water and the brain of the people, you need to come up with a business model where you invest in people, in the skill of the people, in precision. And this is how the watch industry emerged in Switzerland and became a success story. And this is, in a certain way, a model that still exists. Look, uh, for instance, biotechnology. This is one of the cut cutting edge uh, um, areas in, in the Swiss economy. It's very similar. So biotech technology exemplifies the modern Swiss success story. I drove across Zurich to the headquarters of Inspiro, an ETH startup company riding the crest of a scientific wave. Inspiro creates 3D cell tissues for testing in the pharmaceuticals and cosmetic industries. It's a prime example of the innovation that President Guzella attributes to Switzerland's success. Here at the company, we are working in 3D cell biology. Uh, over the last 30 years, cells have always 
been grown in flat layers on plastic surfaces, but that's not the way how our human body is made. Cells live in a 3D environment, everything's layered, everything works together like musicians in a concert, and we developed a technology to bring different cell types together in that three-dimensional context. Patients are waiting for new drugs, right? And sometimes that they are, they really don't understand why it takes so long from an academic understanding of how a certain compound works until it's finally approved. And one reason is that this whole process is very complex and if we can help speeding things up, it might ultimately help saving lives. But why continue to operate in Switzerland, a country known for its more expensive labor force? You know, I think there are probably a lot of reasons for that. The one that we experience most is the wealth of talented and dedicated workforce. It was apparent how the Swiss culture of bottom-up, adapted by ETH, has helped Inspiro take their vision and impact the world in big ways. But do those innovations extend beyond the confines of the laboratory? I went to another ETH startup, Self Nation, to find out. Hi, Emerald. It's so nice to meet you. Self Nation is a young fashion company that, that combines fashion and technology and that offers customers a completely new experience how to buy jeans. Andreas got the idea for Self Nation while denim shopping with his girlfriends one day. I was with friends in, uh, uh, here in Zurich to buy jeans. And actually, my female friends, and they wanted to buy jeans, and they said, okay, I come with you. I was a frustrating afternoon. I, I can't say enjoy this afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's how we came up with the idea. They just ask, hey, isn't there an easier, pro easier solution? And that's what we're trained, especially here at EDH Zurich, problems, problems, and solutions. With access to the internet, it's possible to order jeans from anywhere in the world. Satisfaction just a click away. After you put in the eight measures, you see a 3D model of your body in the browser as you would stand in front of the mirror. And once the Self Nation customer clicks the order button, within 10 seconds a pattern is made and within a minute the pattern is cut. Then the jeans are manufactured at either the Swiss or German sites. In about 10 days you have your Self Nation custom fit jeans. There's a huge potential when you apply technical knowledge to all day, all, all day problems. I love what happens when people are given the freedom to flourish and innovate. But now it was on to Bern, Switzerland's capital city. The Swiss refer to Bern as their federal city, as it is home to Switzerland's small central government. And Bern is home to the Swiss parliament, which consists of 80 members from the different cantons, or states as we call them. It is also where Pierre Bassard, a longtime friend of Dr. Ron's, runs the classical liberal think tank called the Liberalis Institute. I had gotten a chance to see how businesses work in Switzerland, and now Pierre was going to give me a rundown on Swiss governments and the evolution of this system. It is true that, um, you know, at the beginning, I think the, the Swiss and the U.S. setup were very much similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with time, uh, the U.S. became more centralized whereas Switzerland could retain a more decentralized, uh, decentralized setup. This really shows uh, how the power of ideas can move a uh, society and a country for the better or, or, or the worse. But in the case of Switzerland, it was certainly for the better. It is the idea, basically, that government is there to serve citizens. And it is citizens, it is government for citizens by citizens. Swiss governance is broken down into three levels, the municipality or commune, the canton or state level, and the federal. But instead of working top down, government follows the Swiss philosophy of bottom up. It's just freedom to act. Instead of having a, a central government that imposes everything on everybody, you have a, a local freedom to act um, uh, and to lower your taxes or to raise them, if you, you know, that also happens, or to uh, have different sets of, of regulations. Governing principles that facilitate predictability. If you ask me what is the real secret of Switzerland's success, it's a very trivial thing. It's avoiding errors. Being slow and thus avoiding errors that others do is probably one of the most important uh, ingredients in our success story. If the secrets to Switzerland's success are avoiding errors and rewarding innovation, 
I asked Professor Guzella, then how could an area like my home of Appalachia, that is economically declining due to the loss of its main industry, coal, find a way to once again succeed? It's not something that is completely uh, new to us. We had, for instance, a very important textile industry. In the 19th, beginning of the 19th century, this was one of the booming areas. This is completely vanished. So Switzerland had to reinvent itself a couple of times. Especially after the global financial crisis in 2009, when the country had to take a hard look at a specialized banking economy, its solution could also apply to my home in Appalachia. How did Switzerland manage with this crisis that you alluded to in the Appalachian? I would say by reinventing and building on of its own strengths, but adding new ideas to it. I wanted to see how Swiss government operated at the local level, so I asked, where should I visit next? He suggested Zermatt, a small alpine village and home of the majestic Matterhorn. The need for innovation was immediately apparent and presented an excellent example of how Swiss citizens can choose what works best for their individual community. Because gas cars are forbidden, thanks to a vote of the people of Zermatt, Bruno Imboden and his team build and repair these funny little electric cars in their one-stop shop. It's interesting to see how Bruno and his family came up with a way to meet the unique transportation needs of this tiny little village. This picture here. That was my father's work. He was working with horses. Yes, he was a taxi driver. And he has worked day and night, and the time has changing, and the people didn't like to see anymore that uh, the horses are working also in the night. Oh. And so he was looking, what can we do? And he did find, oh, we can make or maybe can buy an electric car to transport people. And that was the big start that also electric cars have been in the village for taxis. And the time before, everybody was going by foot. And now the reason for my trip to Zermatt, to meet with Christoph Bergen, president of the village, to find out how Swiss governance works at the local level. The, the system in, in uh, Switzerland is that the community, they have a lot of rights. So it starts always from the communities up to the, to the government in, in Bern. And, uh, but the biggest rights has always the people. That means that the people have more say individually in different matters of governance, like taxes. And, the, and Switzerland is the, is the only country in the world who can, who can decide of taxes, if they want to pay or not. To pay you have, but how much you have to, to pay. And then we, we, um, uh, we take the taxes and then we have to construct with this money. The money, the money owns, we own the money. Not like in other countries, they have to send it to, like in Italy, to Rome or something, and then it's coming back. No, it stays here. I then discovered a wonderful example of Swiss ingenuity. Four times a year, Christophe confers with his Italian counterpart on the other side of the majestic Matterhorn, a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. From here, about, uh, I would say, about an hour. Okay. I never go by, by car, I have to go around. So it takes me four and a half hour. So when we have a meeting with the Italian, with the president of Chervinia, and we have four meetings every year, so then we meet always on the top of Testa on 3,300 meters. You meet at the top? Yes, we, yes. We and I come from here and he's coming from, from the <laughs> other side. You take a table top? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But always by ski, take the ski with and then after the meeting, <laughs> skis on and down, home again. I was very tempted to stay in this idyllic spot, but Richard wanted me to press on to Switzerland's financial capital. I hated to say goodbye to Zermatt, but I'll be back one day. An international hotspot with a demographic of numerous nationalities, Geneva ranks high in quality of life indexes and is one of the most important financial centers in the world. And one of the reasons Geneva holds such an important place in world finance is thanks to its formerly secretive banking industry. Although there are big corporate banks here, more like we're used to in the US, such as Credit Suisse, Swiss banking is unique because of its smaller private banks which are partnerships where the partners have unlimited liability, meaning everything they have themselves is at stake.
the advantage of having uh, unlimited partners is that the clients know that the moral hazard is much smaller because the owners are the managers, basically. So the managers are not going to cheat the owners because they are the same people. <laughs> Accountability, another reason for Swiss success. As incomes rose in Switzerland and the middle class developed after World War II, there was money available for housing and starting businesses. The growth of the private banking industry meant an influx of capital from the rest of the world. This money could then be used by entrepreneurs to start up businesses, like Nestle, for instance. The capital to start new businesses added to Switzerland's growth and success and meant more employment opportunities for its citizens. I wanted to see it for myself, so I hopped a train to, well, see how trains are made. Yeah, I, I started in uh, 89. I bought a company uh, with uh, 18 employees. Um, and the turnover was 4.5 million uh, US dollars. And I bought 100% uh, of the shares. And now uh, we have um, an um, entrepreneur um, uh, model for, for all uh, employees. Uh, the employees have now 12% uh, of the shares. And I think this is a very good idea to make uh, an employee up to uh, an entrepreneur. And uh, they, the profit uh, is uh, shared by, also by the, by the workers and not only by the owner or the, the, the main shareholder. And there it is already. Bottom up. Yes, absolutely. I think this is the right way to, to uh, integrate the people much more as a, a shareholder, not only as an employee. The idea of giving employees stake in the company really resonated with me. But I have a wonder how any employer could offer such an incentive with the expensive Swiss labor force. And again, I had to ask, why operate in Switzerland? Switzerland is a very high cost, uh, labor cost country, that's correct. But I think we have other advantages. Um, we work uh, much more hours per year than in other countries. Um, for example, in Germany. In Switzerland, we have around 2,000 hours per year. In Germany, it's around 1,500, 1,600 hours. And also, the regulation are uh, much easier to handle than in other uh, European countries. Peter went on to say that a low corporate tax rate encouraged investment. But then he started telling me about his workforce and how a nationwide initiative was key to his astonishing success. We have very well educated uh, people. We have a dual education system. After the high school, the people work three, four days per week in the company and one up to two days um, they uh, go to the school. So we have a very high uh, quality by the, by the employees. And what does Spuler have to say to people who have a dream of being an entrepreneur? Never give up. Never give up. Stadler is an impressive Swiss company for certain. But if the apprenticeship practice helps an international conglomerate, how does it help smaller enterprises? I got my answer as I checked into the Vita Hotel. Aren't you a little young to be working here? Well, actually, I'm not quite working here yet. I'm doing an apprenticeship here in the hotel. Oh, interesting. It's a special thing here in Switzerland. So what does that mean? You're like training and then... I am training. That is exactly what it is. Vincent explained that like the apprentices I had met at Stadler, he works at the hotel three days a week, then goes to school the other two days of the week, where he studies subjects that apply to the hospitality industry, as well as interdisciplinary studies, including language and arts, with students looking to pursue other industries. He has also gotten the opportunity to work in different departments within the hotel to gain experience. I'm at the third, I'm in my third year, and I'll finish this summer. I have my, my exams coming up. Um, I have the wonderful opportunity to, to uh, stay here and work here a little longer. So you graduate and you have a guaranteed job. Which is wonderful. So the student employees gain real world experience and then employers get the opportunity to train their future workforce. Genius. <laughs> These apprentices are trained in the companies. You need to have the apprentices in the companies because the companies, the real economy know what's going on and where the people, the workforce is needed. You don't learn by watching other people doing it. You have to do it 
yourself. Yeah. So that's one other ingredient of our success story. And then, of course, the translation of this education into new things, being it research, being it technology, being new companies. I've seen here in Switzerland the importance of individual freedom that seems to be the real key to Switzerland's success. Richard wanted me to understand that it's a concept deeply rooted in the past. Well, Emerald, part of the Protestant Reformation began here in Zurich a few years after Martin Luther um, had started the effort in Germany. Richard explained how the Protestant Reformation, begun by Martin Luther in 1517, was the catalyst for the freedoms the Swiss cantons enjoy today. So you have to fuse economics with history. As I suspected, he knew the perfect person to do just that. We headed off to Bastiat Park to meet up with Richard's longtime friend, Vicky Curzon. Vicky was going to give me the historical tour of Old City Geneva while detailing more on how the Protestant Reformation was an important influence on the Swiss way of governance and business. Vicky is an economist, a former and first woman president of the prestigious Mount Pelerin Society and a retired professor at the University of Geneva. Emerald, I wanted to show you this Reformation monument because this is where you can see how uh, Geneva in particular, but Switzerland also, became Protestant. And that's important from an economic point of view because the Protestants deny the divine right of kings to rule. And that means that the kings can't grab money as they always used to, completely denying property rights. And here you have one of the first Bill of Rights which says that the levying of money without the consent of Parliament is illegal. And that dates from 1689, it's a long time ago, well before the American Revolution, which also right. contains the same, the same rights, property rights. Is that where we got it for our American? Well, it's, it's, of yes, of course. We get all, our, all these ideas come out of the Enlightenment, uh, which puts uh, individual rights before society and before the divine right of kings to rule. All this seemed very relevant to my own story. After being driven out of Scotland by the English, my Scottish ancestors made their way to the Appalachian Mountains in America during the Enlightenment seeking freedom. So it's interesting to see that my heritage in some way tied to that of Switzerland. Well, indeed. And if you think that John Knox and Calvin, more or less contemporaries, and they're, you know, Scotland and Geneva, way miles apart, but the speed at which the ideas flew across the whole of Europe, and in fact, you know, sent the whole continent into, into the wars of religion, as we know. And again, it was these ideas generated by the Reformation that man is master of his own destiny and should have the free will to choose and the belief that a man's property is his own, not to be owned by the government, that created the foundation for a society that allows Swiss citizens to be so successful so many centuries later. It also impacts how Swiss view their relationship with the rest of the world. Well, Switzerland has practiced free trade for a very long time, almost, I'd say, two centuries of free trade. That's already enormous. When you're practicing free trade, you can't really subsidize uh, industries. It costs too much. And that raised the question of financial responsibility. The Swiss themselves have never overspent. That is to say, their government has been sensible. The Swiss themselves are pretty sensible. So as we know in a macroeconomic terms, the, the country does not run a deficit, doesn't run a current account deficit. In fact, it, it, it's, it tends to oversupply capital to the rest of the world. So the central bank has never had to worry about how to finance so anything. If property rights are reasonably respected, then the economy will flourish. And if you, if you don't respect property rights, then the, the economy collapses. And it's as simple as that. And we see every place around the world, and it doesn't matter um, skin color or, or race or climate or anything mm -hmm. else, good policies work every place on the planet, and bad policies can destroy any place. But fortunately, Switzerland has mostly benefited from good policies. Take, for instance, the Economic Freedom of the World Index. The judging criteria for this index includes several of the principles born out of the Reformation. First of all, rule of law, property rights, tax rates, ease of starting a business, and monetary stability. And Switzerland ranks pretty high on this index, coming in at number four. The U.S., in comparison, comes in at number 12, 
as it has continued to fall from the top in recent years. What you have to do is give people opportunities and then they can flourish. Just like this dog can yeah. flourish. Uh, it's, 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 she likes that idea. Well, she likes that. <laughs> we can tell. This She's dog, a free market economic. We can tell this, this dog likes the professor. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about something Pierre Brassard, president of the Liberalis Institute in Bern, said. It's not a genetic thing, if you like. You know, it's not a genetic Swiss thing. The basic factor for the country's success is economic freedom, as it is in everywhere else in the world. And why has economic freedom prevailed in this country, or has prevailed more in this country than in others? It is certainly uh, worth pondering. It has a lot to do with institutions institutions and a mindset that encourages innovation and rewards effort. Lessons I could take back home. Well, my journey had come to an end here in Switzerland. Before heading back to Washington, Richard and I sat by Lake Geneva taking in the iconic fountain and discussing what I had learned. People have control over their own lives. They feel like they're masters of their destiny. We saw in these little towns of how they can make decisions and the central government can't come in and dictate to them. And they make decisions about their own lives. And the other thing we saw everybody emphasize was the importance of political and economic stability. Uh, this is about the most stable political environment in the world. And it's also had a very stable currency. Property rights are protected. And so you feel secure about investing in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a great deal of honesty here. There's a tradition that um, very little corruption. And so that if you want to bring your money someplace in the world, here's a good place to do it. And it's logical. Yeah, it is. And it's just, it was so nice to see how people felt empowered here mm -hmm. and feel like they matter and what they say matters. And, and it's not just they felt that way. It is indeed true. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, though, in seeing how it works in Switzerland, why isn't this the model in more places around the world? Well, I think is there's a natural tendency of people like to control other people. And so you've had the long tradition of rulers from the top down. And the Swiss were unique in finding a way to have it come from the bottom up. But clearly we see this growth in places around the world. And Switzerland shows and depending on the particular canton, because they vary in size of government from canton to canton, that small government can work. That if people are individually responsible for their own lives. Again, there's a social safety net. Nobody goes hungry in this country. Nobody's without medical care. But that doesn't necessitate a very large central government with an overwhelming bureaucracy. And I was surprised to learn that 22% of the people are foreign born and they pick up Swiss values very quickly. And as we see, there's people from countries all over the world, a whole variety of races and ethnic groups, and they understand this basic Swiss model. So no matter where they're from, they acclimate to the Swiss model extremely well. Yeah, because they see it works. As I watched the sun go down over the Alps, creating a beautiful painting of the sky in Lake Zurich, I thought to myself, Switzerland just might be the happiest place on earth. And here's to the hope that other less fortunate places around the globe can, like Switzerland, become an improbable success.